Today we're going to be talking about how to use Taylor's inequality to show that a function is equal to the sum of its Maclaurin series. And in this particular problem, we've been given the function f of x is equal to hyperbolic sine of x or sine h of x. And we've gone ahead and written the Maclaurin series of this function. You can derive it if you want to by creating a table for the Taylor or Maclaurin series, writing out n fn of x, fn of 0, because remember we're talking about the Maclaurin series, so we're talking about the Taylor series centered at 0 or, or having the value a equals 0, and you could create the table and the series, and what you would find is that when you wrote the Maclaurin series representation of that expanded series, you'd get this value here, which is x to the 2n plus 1 over the quantity 2n plus 1 factorial. What we're trying to show is that this infinite sum, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of this Maclaurin series representation here, is equal to hyperbolic sine of x, that these are actually equal to one another, we're trying to prove that, or in other words, that this infinite sum here is representative of hyperbolic sine of x for all values of x. Now the way that we're going to do that is by attacking Taylor's inequality one piece at a time. So what Taylor's inequality tells us is that if the absolute value of the n plus one-th term of the series is less than or equal to some number m for the absolute value of x minus a less than or equal to d, and keep in mind here that because we're dealing with Maclaurin series, a is going to be zero, and so this piece here is just going to become instead the absolute value of x less than or equal to d then the remainder term is going to satisfy this big inequality here for, again here, the absolute value of x less than or equal to d. Remember that if you're using Taylor's inequality for a Taylor series, you'll have to keep the x minus a because the Taylor series could be centered about some non-zero value. But when we're dealing with a Maclaurin series, of course, the value of a is zero, and so you can treat these absolute value of x minus a less than or equal to d as just the absolute value of x less than or equal to d. So what we're looking at now is the n plus one term. That's what's represented here by this f n plus one of x. Remember that when we're dealing with hyperbolic sine, the n plus one term is always going to be hyperbolic cosine or hyperbolic sine. Because if we take the derivative of hyperbolic sine, what we get is hyperbolic cosine of x. If we take the derivative again, we're back to hyperbolic sine of x. Take it again, we're back to hyperbolic cosine of x, and it just keeps alternating like that. So the n plus one term is always going to be represented by one of these two functions, and the way we can express that is we can say f n plus one of x is always going to be equal to either hyperbolic sine or equal to hyperbolic cosine. Now essentially what we're saying is that we're replacing this f n plus 1 of x value here with either hyperbolic sine of x or hyperbolic cosine of x. Now we need to find a value for m. Well, this problem is really convenient because we know that hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine will never have a value greater than 1, right? If we graph these two functions on an xy coordinate plane, what we see is that just like sine and cosine, they oscillate back and forth and the value never goes above 1. So if we set m equal to 1, right, we say the value of m is 1, then we know that this inequality right here will always be satisfied. It will always be true. Hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, no matter what value we pick for x, will always remain less than or equal to 1. So we're able to pick a value for 1. If we picked a value of 1 half or 1 fourth or 0, that would constrain these functions further than we'd be able to. But if we're able to pick a maximum value for these two functions, a value above which we know these two functions will never go, then we can safely assume that that largest value can be the value of n, and this inequality will always still be satisfied. So we want to pick a value of 1 for m, and then what we say is that this remainder term, r sub n of x, that's the remainder term, satisfies this inequality where the absolute value of the remainder term, r sub n of x, is going to be less than or equal to 1, the value we picked for m, 
divided by the quantity n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus a. Remember here again we're dealing with the Maclaurin series, so we don't have to include this minus a because it's just minus 0. So instead we just get the absolute value of x raised to the n plus 1 power. Now in order to prove that this inequality is true, we're going to use a little squeeze theorem application here, and we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of both sides of this inequality. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of r sub n of x less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over the quantity n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1. Now what we see if we look at the right hand side of this inequality is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this right hand side is going to be equal to 0. We don't even have to look at the absolute value of x raised to the n plus 1. All we need to do is look at this coefficient here, 1 divided by the quantity n plus 1 factorial, to see that this is going to be 0. Because if we evaluate this expression here at n equals infinity, right, we plug in an infinitely large value here for n, we're going to get some infinitely large value plus 1, so in other words, still just an infinitely large value. If we take that extremely large value, let's pretend it's 10 million, and we take 10 million factorial, that's still going to be a ridiculously large number in that denominator, a huge number. So we still just have 1, a constant, divided by a huge, 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 huge number. As n gets closer and closer to infinity, this number will just get larger and larger, and therefore 1 divided by this infinitely large number is going to become 0. So because this becomes 0 right here, we have 0 times this value, absolute value of x raised to the n plus 1, it's still all just going to be 0. So what we're left with is the limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value of this remainder term here, r sub n of x, is going to be less than or equal to 0. The remainder term can never be a negative value, right? Just intuitively, logically, we know that a remainder term has to be either 0 or some positive number. Because remember that a remainder term basically is what's left over from an approximation that gets close to the exact value. If there's some exact value and we're able to find it explicitly, we find the exact value, then there is no remainder, the remainder is zero. If we come close, but we can't get the exact value, we can only get an approximation, then we say we have some approximation with some small remainder, basically some small margin of error. That's always gonna be a positive value or it's gonna be zero if our approximation is exact and we get that exact value. So we know that this remainder term can't be less than zero, but because this inequality tells us it has to be either less than or equal to zero, we know that this has to be zero. So what we say is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of r sub n of x is going to be equal to zero, that the remainder is equal to zero. And if the remainder is equal to zero, then basically we know we have an exact value. It's not an approximation that we're able to find it exactly or explicitly. And so because the remainder is zero, because we've gotten to this point and shown that the remainder is zero, we can conclude that hyperbolic sine of x is accurately represented by and is equal to the infinite sum here, this sum of its Maclaurin series.